We also know that creditors combing through the rubble at Repco encountered some unknown, though presumably large amount, of short positions for which no corresponding long shares could be found. In other words, naked short positions. Put it all together, and you get what I'm betting is a half billion dollars, probably more, of naked shorts, that is to say, IOUs, out there bouncing around the market that Repco owns investors like you and me who believe they have real shares in their brokerage accounts. That's right, if you own stock, you too might be a Repco creditor and not even know it. Of course, what makes radioactive waste so problematic is that it costs much more to clean this stuff up than it does to actually make it. And similarly, what financial markets value at half a billion dollars would cost many, many times that amount to actually go out and buy in. Repco couldn't have afforded it under the best of circumstances, which is why it had no choice but to move it around. All this, in turn, would explain why the courts went to such unusual lengths to keep details of Repco's mystery radioactive liability confidential. After all, everybody knows that there's risk inherent to extending credit, but tens of thousands of investors suddenly learning the shares they bought never really existed? Well, that certainly would cause irreparable harm in the form of a crisis of confidence followed by a liquidity crisis, not unlike what we're seeing now. Okay, let's zoom out now to see how the patterns observed in this case might help us to understand the larger system. But before we do, we're going to take a brief math and science break. Determining how many stock IOUs are coursing through the system at any one time is about as easy as counting the number of neutrinos passing through the Earth at any one time. That's not because failed trades, like neutrinos, are tiny, nearly massless, and all but undetectable, but because the system itself goes far out of its way to obscure this information. And so, as with neutrinos, the best we can do is estimate the scope of the phenomenon. In keeping with the subatomic particle theme, you could say failed trades come in a few distinct flavors. Some are created within the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. These are easy to count because they are regularly disclosed. The balance of failed trades are created outside the DTCC, and we know much less about these. However, we do know that some occur when brokerages settle trades directly with one another in what's called X-clearing. Many others occur when clearing happens offshore. Now let's take these one at a time. Of failed trades originating within the DTCC, as of the end of March 2008, the combined value was around $9 billion. Of those originating in X-clearing, the DTCC itself has estimated the figure to be at least four times the amount clearing within the DTCC, although other credible sources conservatively estimate it and the offshore accumulation at something closer to 15 times the amount in the DTCC, or around $135 billion. Adding those two numbers together brings us to near $150 billion spread around various securities brokerages, with higher concentrations obviously in the larger ones. Before moving ahead, let's return to the pattern we observed in the case of Sedona and Repco, initially replacing specific names with general ones. When we do, it looks like this. Short-selling hedge funds seeking to drop the share price of small publicly traded companies do so by selling vast quantities of non-existent stock through brokerages, thereby saddling those brokerages with enduring liabilities which would remain hidden until one goes suddenly bankrupt, which would then cast some light on their books. Then trustees discover the liability they recognize that, were the nature of it to be revealed to the public, it might just be enough to create a panic sufficient to crack the system. Recognizing this, the government takes unusual steps to mitigate the problem while hiding details of what should be a transparent process, claiming that to do otherwise would result in some serious but undefined harm to the public. Now let's see if we can find a circumstance on the macro level which this pattern might help to explain. The week of September 14, 2008, Lehman Brothers, a brokerage much larger than Refco, fell into bankruptcy. While Lehman was known to be much less likely to engage in naked shorting than the other prime brokers, the firm undoubtedly had heaps of failed trades to deal with anyway, and in quantities much larger than Refco's. So we have the bankrupt brokerage and failed trades. Now if the pattern persists, we'd expect to encounter a secretive, speedily implemented government response spun as necessary to prevent some unspecified harm to the system, right? Well, the same week Lehman went bankrupt, the Federal Reserve substantially relaxed the standards which previously only allowed it to accept AAA-rated securities as collateral. At the same time, the Fed disbursed $60 billion under the primary dealer and other broker-dealer credit facility. The next week, that amount had increased by another $50 billion, and the following week by another $40 billion to reach $147 billion. So who got all that money? 
We don't know, because the Fed won't say. Bloomberg News noticed what was going on and filed a Freedom of Information Act request seeking documents revealing the recipients of these billions and the nature of the collateral they posted. At first, the Fed stonewalled and ultimately refused to comply with Bloomberg's FOIA request, saying the U.S. is facing an unprecedented crisis in which loss of confidence in and between financial institutions can occur with lightning speed and devastating effects. Notwithstanding calls for enhanced transparency, the board must protect against the substantial multiple harms that might result from disclosure of the recipients of the Fed loans. In its considered judgment and in view of current circumstances, it would be a dangerous step to release this otherwise confidential information. Bloomberg has since filed a lawsuit against the Fed seeking to compel release of the requested information, and I wish them luck in that effort. While it's true that any evidence that the $147 billion might have been related to a radioactive pile of fell trades discovered in Lehman's basement is circumstantial, here's something else to consider. Three days after Lehman declared bankruptcy, the SEC, following years of refusing to take meaningful action on the matter of illegal making shorting, or even acknowledge that it's a problem, suddenly took rather dramatic steps to limit the practice. It's as though somebody with authority had finally become aware of the Chernobyl scenario brewing beneath the surface and sent urgent word down to contain the problem. I hope this is not what's going on and look forward to being proven wrong because if I'm correct, then we taxpayers find ourselves on the hook for billions of dollars worth of failed trades that might cost many trillions of dollars to buy in a consequence of the greed of a few hedge funds and the ineptitude of the regulator that they captured long ago. And this whole scenario would seem to redefine the increasingly popular term, systemic risk. It would also suggest the existence of a problem that would seem to make what appeared to be a very complex problem rather insignificant by comparison. To get the latest on this problem as it evolves, in addition to suggestions on what you can do about it, please visit deepcapture.com.